Welcome back, everyone. So, our second part here will be about, more specifically, early intervention. And what does early intervention truly mean for our work when we work with neural reflex integration? That can also be referred as a neural modulation um, techniques, techniques. Okay, early intervention. Why would we want to intervene so early? The brain and the nervous system at birth contain billions of neurons. And once the baby is born, then it's a matter of connecting those neurons. The neurons number and the organization of those neurons, once the synapses are creating, will really reflect how a brain functions. It will literally influence everything in our lives. So at birth, infants have pretty much everything, but it's a matter of being properly wired and connected, those brain cells that they need. The wiring and connection between the cells to build the, what we call the net nerve, the nerve net system, network. Okay, so early movement and the sensory experience is truly what creates the um, network of nerve. So Aristotle was saying that if there is no movement, there is no life, period. As simple as this. And it's such a true, deep statement because in infants, the only way for them to create that brain, like to have properly functioning cortex, they must move. And unfortunately, with the equipment that we have for babies, there is a major tendency of putting those babies in pieces of equipment and they have no opportunity of natural movement. If we were born like me, or at the time we were put on the floor, there was no bouncer, no um, Exosaurcer, no jumper, no playpen, and so on. And you were on the floor and you had to move. And this is how babies are creating the maturity, matur maturation of their brain. Um, the sensory experiences are also like a big, big um, component for brain development. So, what I want to show you, and this is what I bring to the pediatricians when I go talk to them. I have this slide with me. And I explain that you have all the neurons and the connection are starting. Here, at birth, this is how it looks like for the same amount of nervous tissue. You have this much synapses at birth. And at three months, and this is what's happening. That's the nerve network, the building of the synapses. So from birth to three months, it multiplies by 20. This, is, this reflects the functioning of a brain in an infant. And then when you look at from three months to 15 months, it's more, but it's not 20 more, 20 times more. The, the difference is not such obvious in a greater time frame, truly. And then from 15 months to three years, it's still more dense, but still. Did you see this from here to there, zero to three months? And guess what? This is the time where the pediatrician says, oh, your baby is so little, she's so young, let's wait and see. I mean, it's so painful to hear when a baby with a known diagnosis, I'm talking even babies with diagnosis of Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, premature babies, for God's sake, they have so much challenges to start with, and they're from zero to three months, and we're waiting before we start the intervention. I mean, what kind of concepts is this truly speaking? This is not just not acting, it's like really causing inhibition. We are not for inhibition, we're for integration. So I think it's a simple picture, but 
pretty powerful. We cannot accept to wait and see during this golden window of intervention for our babies. So that's one element of early intervention. Now here we have the typical therapeutic intervention that usually is prompt by a traditional, traditional way we will say, oh, we have a developmental disease, we have a diagnosis. You know, it's, it's all the traditional way to see things and to say, oh, by the way, we have an established condition, let's go for intervention. MNRI, the Maskutola method, says, why would you even wait for a diagnosis? <laughs> let's go with early intervention, A, one based on what reflexes are telling us, but here we'll go even further with early prevention because now the studies and the work and the experience of Dr. Maskutova and her team shows that if you work with the reflexes, regardless if there is like any type of established condition, you are strengthening the nervous system. And if in the future something happens, then the baby will be much more resilient to face whatever event that can be. So, ideally you would think, well, why don't we have all babies going through a reflex screening and, and go and look for it? In the US, at one point, babies were discharged from the hospital, and then when they were two, three years old, they were not speaking. And People were like, oh my goodness, the, the child is too, no language, let's check the hearing. Yeah, the baby's already two, three year old, and you just lost, not just my first golden window, but you lost like the first three years of life to, to do something about speech and language development. So, at least the pediatric academy says, well, from now on, no babies will, will leave the hospital without a hearing screen. This is the right way to do things. Prevention. Imagine, now that you know a bit more about reflexes, or some of you know much more, to have a reflex screen and say, oh, you remember when I stroked the foot, <laughs> it went the wrong way. <clears throat> this has to do with tiptoe walking, this has to do with this, with that, PTSD, and so on. The power of that kind of reflex screen is like unimaginable because um, we would A, save the babies earlier, but some would say, well, can you imagine what it could, would cost to the society to have every single newborn screen? But it would cost millions less because now you're not having a child with issues for many years of therapy and so on. There are like very hard to believe numbers of what costs health care for a child with autism, for example, or things like this. So it is about early intervention, it is about prevention also, because stresses, we are all going to have stresses in our lives. Don't, we cannot think that we can just eliminate stress. What we can do is to make those babies, those children, us adults, more resilient. And the more you work with the reflexes, the more mature and the more resilient you get the brain. Every parent, if you tell them this, they are not going to go against, would you like something to make your baby stronger? So next time your baby has an ear infection or next time your baby has a poisoning with food, he might get sick, she might get sick, but she's gonna recover much faster because she has good protective unit of the brain known as reflex. So we're talking about a proactive health care. That's health care. What we do traditional, this is a sick care. We wait for the sickness, we wait for the problem to decide to intervene. Big difference in concept. So now what does the reflex say? We're going to work with early development, we're going to work with recent trauma, and we're going to do some prevention. And here I want to point out, you see early development, intrauterine development, that's what I was talking to you about working with pregnant women. 
have an impact on the unborn baby and on the mom. Because when something goes wrong with reflex, it either happens before birth, during the intrauterine uh, time, Dr. Mosquito has developed tools to work with this, or it happens at birth. And birth, again, birth is a process. It's a traumatic process in the sense it's a big change. Or it happens after birth, during the newborn time, the early infancy, and so on. Just an example at birth. If baby is born through C-section, this is already leading to challenges because naturally a baby is meant to be born vaginally. That's going to turn on the reflex. The baby has to make its way through the birth canal, use the pushing, use the crawling that you saw, use the trunk extension and so on. So a baby that's born through C-section is already missing some steps there. This is warranting some intervention. Pretty easy to fix if we go right after birth. And I'm not saying that C-section are not justified at times. There are circumstances where a C-section is a necessity. But what needs to be considered is those women that decide to have a C-section by convenience. That's another story. And if they knew, if they had this knowledge, I'm not sure they would make this kind of decision. So anyway, this is a different stage of life where that can uh, trigger the intervention. Okay. When we say early intervention, it means early age-wise, but it also means early intervention after a trauma. If a person has a stroke, early intervention means within 72 hours of the trauma, you're going to get the greatest uh, results. So it is not just about a chronological age-related things. Topic is here is on infants, but have this in mind. Okay, so next here, um, I don't think I want to go too much about prematurity. I mean, this is my daily word, uh, and I work with babies. But we know that to start with, prematurity has a lot of in utero time uh, circumstances. Could be mom has an infection, cervical problem, smoking. A short time between pregnancy, all those are the main causes of prematurity. So when we see this, we know that the emergence of the reflex is may be disrupted during pregnancy. Okay, so any baby that is born premature is already a red flag for intervention. That's what's happening before the baby is born. And then the baby is born and has to go to the neonatology intensive care unit which is really not a friendly environment. It saves lives, thank God, <laughs> but it will um, expose the baby to a lot of um, uh, challenges, which will create a lot of protection and negative protection at that moment. I mean, just look at the picture, it speaks for itself, and this is a baby that is very sick in the unit. You see IVs, the lines, central lines, surgery. I mean, how can you possibly imagine a baby getting out of a NICU intact? I mean, we organize our conference. We have a few uh, children here with us that were in this position. And sometimes, from a neonatologist's point of view, the baby is saved. They save the lives. The baby is out of the NICU. That's it. It's behind. We're not talking about this anymore. We wish this would be uh, the reality. But any child that spends time in the NICU should have some sort of recovery intervention. Okay, so this is just to show you too that there is a big link between prematurity and autism, ADHD, learning disability. So if we know that prematurity means that there was a big disruption in reflex development, <laughs> That explains why there is this link between prematurity and autism, because we also know, based on Dr. Maskutova's research, that children in the spectrum or with learning disability, dyslexia, their reflexes do not look good. They are not integrated. So here you have your triangle that's pretty clear about the risks. Now, I want to make sure that you don't misunderstood 
MNRI is not meant to diagnose. Never you're going to hear or have us say, oh, because of those reflex, your child is in the spectrum. Your baby has dyslexia. It is not our place. We're not, this is the medical uh, responsibility. What we can tell based on the reflex is that, oh, with this kind of profile and response with the reflex, your child is at high risk to present with the characteristic of so and so, such and such uh, condition. But we are not stepping on the medical uh, boundaries. We are a team. <laughs> this is a slide that I put together, but look at heel sticks, tape removal, diaper rash, feeding tubes. I mean, this is the life of an EQ baby. So you professionals, whenever you have a baby, a child in your hands, and you go through a medical history, and you hear that this baby was in the NICU, think about that. I mean, we wonder why they have a defensive, tactile, and a lot of challenges. Okay, so I'm gonna go a bit faster here. And again, we have a diagram with the traditional approach that will look at the symptoms, MNRI, wants to go to the root, the cause of the problem. And traditionally, we look at the motor. Milestone is a big thing. All of us, PTOT, speech, psychologists, we have standardized tool to um, assess the level of function of children, whether it's in the motor skills area, speech, feeding, and so on. But that is a current. This is at the moment of the child is showing those issues. It's late. Why would you wait for a child to show a dysfunctional gait to say, oh, my child has a problem with walking where, as an infant, there were red flags that walked up. And I will share with you my experience when I brought the first child to Dr. Muscatua. She was a, a patient or a client of mine, six years old, bright little girl, very low muscle tone, not sure what was the diagnosis. She was very shy. I bring her to Dr. Muscatola, first time ever. And the little girl did not even open her mouth. She was shy. I didn't give any information to Dr. Muscatola. And she goes with her reflex assessment, da, 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 comes to the oral motor um, assessment. And at one point, she looks at this little girl and says, hmm, I see that you're a very bright little girl. You're doing super good at school. But it's also difficult for you to say some words, right? And the little girl is like, and then the doctor goes with Thomas says, like, for example, can you say the word school? And at this moment, her mom, her dad, her therapist are like, how is this possible that, based on the reflex assessment, Dr. Maskutova brings this word, which was one of the main goal of the parents, to be able to say the SK sound, where she would say tsur, like she could not put her tongue together and so on. So that was my moment where I say, okay, any speech therapist, that does an articulation assessment will ask the child to go through a list of uh, names and sounds and say it. And then you say, oh, okay, that's how she's pronouncing. Yeah, obviously she cannot say SK. But without hearing this, the reflexes reflected this. It is like I'm a physiotherapist. If I want to know the gait deviation, I'm gonna say, okay, can you please walk? And I'm gonna watch and say, okay, the foot goes in, da, da, da. okay, oh, can you walk back? Because I was looking at the ankle, now I need to look at the knee. <laughs> you go, uh, can you walk one more time so I can have the whole picture with the hips and the spine and so on? With the reflexes, you have a child on the table, you don't need to see necessarily how the walk is, but you know based on the foot reflex, based on the press, based on the spinal reflex that it's challenging for this child to walk. You can even pre predict, not predict, but understand the type of deviation this child will have. This cannot 
but I hide the meaning of reflexes. I mean, this is how powerful it is. You have this in, you do this before the task, the skill and abilities is supposed to happen. So you can go with early intervention. All right, next I will show you an example here of one very known reflex. You put your fingers in a baby's hand and oops, the finger closed. We all know that grasp. There is a journey for this reflex. It's going to evolve based on age. First 10 days of life, the thumb will be in. And then the thumb will come out. And then the thumb will go on the side. And then the baby will be able to differentiate and, differentiate and so on. What we have, the knowledge that Dr. Masbutova is sharing and uh, demonstrating after experience, is like this type of grasp. But then the old baby, it's okay. The baby is recovering, or it's just going through birth, there is a lot of cortisol, lots of adrenaline. But did you know that if you see this on a four month old baby, you're starting thinking, hmm. There's something not happening the way it's supposed to. If you see this on a 12-month-old baby, uh, now you're really getting concerned. And if you see this on a 10-year-old, cerebral palsy children are like this. If you see this on an adult that's going like this, this is a sign of serious struggle for the brain because it is not meant to be. You cannot use your hand if you are like this. You will never be able to write properly and so on. So, pediatricians, they do their visit. Shouldn't they know about this? Oh, I just had a well visit for a four-month-old baby and the baby comes here like this. There is something that needs to be done about this. Again, I want to illustrate the power of reflex, what it means. And then you know what it means. And then you have tools to change this. That's the big point here. But see, this is very primitive for a very, very newborn baby. Then you want the thumb to come out. This is more proper when the thumb is opposite and so on. This is a transition state. You have all sorts of um, information. Another example, here is four babies on their tummy. What does that tell you? It requires some reflexes, head writing, spinal perez, uh, TLR, tonic labyrinthine reflex. If a baby is like this at a certain age, it's okay. Zero to one month, we're okay with this. A four-month-old baby that would present like this with the arms back, that's not good. There is a problem. The baby is not understanding gravity, for example. What do you think is the age of this baby having a head up the arms this way? This is okay, but look, it's pretty asymmetrical. There is one arm back, the other one is forward. We have some asymmetries here. Asymmetry means one side of the body is under protection. We need to do something about this. And so on. So, as a professional, and if we have the knowledge of MNRI, we can make great sense of great meaning of what we see there, just by observing the power of reflexes. Same thing in this position. You have a baby on their tummy. You have a baby in the tonic labyrinthine position where the legs are tucked. Look at the position of the feet. This is another piece of information. For example, I don't know if I can um, bring this bigger. Maybe not. Okay, the feet are turned out. Here they're in. Another illustration of a baby. Would you be concerned for, con concerned for a baby two months that looks like this? Is it okay? Pediatrician says, oh, maybe it's fine. Look at the space between the ear and the shoulder. Look at the eyes. Look at the arms. This is not okay. If we don't do anything for this baby, it will be some challenges. Better know this at two months than at uh, preschool time and so on. So you got the point of why we need to have this type of knowledge. This is what we explain in our classes. For example, zero to 10 days, this is okay. One month, this is okay. This is where the eyes go. The head is 45 degrees. By two months of age, we want 90 degrees, we want the arm, and so on. 
big red flag. And all of us professionals working with infants, we should know that by two months of age, we need a head up with the coherence between the head position and the eyes. If this is not achieved, dyslexia, learning disability, and so on, may be, I mean, the baby may be at risk for that. Another position you want to look at, how do the baby look on their back? Are the legs up? Are they tight? Are they completely flaccid like this? Is this okay? This baby is a month old. Is that okay to have the legs up like this? When he's half asleep, it's too much tone, too much protection. And so on. So, lots of examples. Another big, big reflex that Dr. Masbutova is describing. It's called the hands pulling. Now, this is a six day old infant when you pull a baby, which you don't. This is for the purpose of demonstrating this was a very healthy baby. But I want to, to show you a six day old baby. You bring the baby up, head is lying. This is a healthy baby, you would not do this, but it should. Now, how many babies we see do this when they are four months, six months, two years old, and again, Dr. Masutova's research shows that children on the spectrum, for example, almost none of them have a proper hand spooling. So we know this afterwards, but you go the other way around and say, oh, a baby that shows that lag with hand spooling after two months, after four months, two months, there is something that is not right. Let's do some work. Okay, look at this seven month old. I mean, this is not a good uh, response for that kind of reflex. Okay, this child is like six years, yeah? Very poor speech, and he started at school, and he has to go to home school. Can you repeat the question for the microphone? Yeah, and uh, Dr. Masgutova was. Um, saying that this child is now six years old, yeah, and he's doing good in school. He's doing good, but his speech development is delayed. And yes, but has he, uh, challenges with his speech development. And as baby, he was showing multiple uh, dysfunctional reflexes. He did some work to be done at that moment. So another example for you guys that are speech therapists, for example, the Sucking reflex. It's a big, big, big piece of neurodevelopment. Sure, we know how oh, sucking is about eating. Yes. Is it just about eating? No. It has way deeper meaning of this. Because a baby that does not have good sucking will have some difficulty eating, but some emotion. We all know if a baby's screaming and you put a pacifier and they start sucking, it calms them down. Sucking is a physiological need for a baby to regulate with emotion. So it is also has to do with uh, speech development. If you watch a baby drink from a bottle, look what is going on there. A lot of movement. If you speak, look what is going on there. A lot of movement. We need to work all those muscles. So babies are sent home, say, oh, he finished the bottle. It doesn't matter, some nurses are like pouring the milk inside the mouth. The baby didn't do anything. And then starts a lot of issues. Because we know here also the criteria to discharge a baby from the hospital, they have to finish the bottle. That's all what matters. But how do they finish the bottle? This is the other question. Five-day-old baby that comes, discharge from the hospital, baby's fine, the pediatrician comes, says, your baby's doing beautifully. The mom, five days later, after giving birth, is in tears. She says, there is something I don't understand with my baby. He's not breastfeeding properly. And I check the sucking, sucking reflex. And look what's going on. Here with the tongue, he's not sure, the tongue is all over the place, it's not cupped, it is not creating a good negative pressure to suck the milk. Do you think a baby like this will nurse?
properly, it's going to be so difficult for the baby. Then this baby is uncontrollable, cannot calm down, has a lot of adrenaline and so on, and it's a chain of response that is very problematic. So, and then speech later. Let's work on sucking. Dr. Maskutova has amazing techniques that will teach a baby the proper pattern of sucking. You do this at five days old, you're in good shape. You're going to teach this baby. You try to do this with a two-year-old that cannot speak or has difficulties, picky eater, doesn't eat certain things and so on. It's not too late, but you are in for a long run there. Okay, three-month-old baby. Here we go. I want to say who is this baby. She's taking her bubble. Look, look, everything that's happening. This is what we need for speech later. Sucking is not just about eating. You want some jaw excursion, you want a good seal around the nipple, and so on. You can see a bit better here. This is Dr. Masvatova's great grand, uh, grand niece, great grand niece here. You have some rhythm. No seating, no hands falling, no on bell, no belly time. So you learn to repeat what she said. Yes. So Dr. Masvidova is saying that the, the other grandma of this baby is a pediatrician, and she was very scared, saying, "Oh, don't put my baby on her tummy. Oh, we cannot put the baby in an upright position." She was like really apprehensive with all those things that in our world is developmentally supportive of proper development because doctors are not taught this way. If you uh, notice, there was like a nice spooning of her tongue. Sucking is also a source of tons of information. Okay, you are getting tired. I'm almost there. I want to share with you now. Remember my introduction with genetic a reflex is a genetic unit of the brain. Now, automatic gait. This is one of my favorite reflex. You hold the baby, like see Dr. Masutova do. You bring the gravity forward, and the baby goes with steps. Not just steps, amazing steps. Like, you see, I mean, physio, we do gait analysis. Heel strike, roll of the foot, toe up, and it's this highly sophisticated pattern for, you can see this on a 20 minutes old infant. This one is a bit older, but how is this possible for little human to show such level of sophistication of gait? The answer is reflexive, automaticity, genetically given. And look what it looks like for this baby is about a month old. <laughs> you see a heel strike, the toes are coming up, pushing, moving forward, the head, one month old baby have no head control, supposedly. Aren't you amazed when you see this? Okay, this will last at the end of the first month, maybe second month, because it is the unconditioned stage. All right, now next we have here, I have a baby, two weeks old, which should show what we just saw. But this little baby girl has Down syndrome. Down syndrome is a genetic disorder, trisomy 21, everybody knows about Down syndrome. And we all know, very well studied, we have tons of data that those children start walking between two and three. The norm is 11 months to 13 months. We know this. It's established genetic disorder. So the automatic gait obviously supports walking later. It does other things, not just walking. But let's focus on walking. What do you think this baby is going to do? with this genetic disorder, if you check at two weeks the automatic gait. It is not, it's going to look what we call pathological. There 
is not much in those little legs. Steps are not happening. Head is not coming in extension. The spine is completely down. This is almost no response. We knew this kind of because the baby has a disorder. There was a disruption during intrauterine time. Okay? All right. So here I will do one minute of what we do the work. I'm going to try to activate some of the points according to the Muscatola method. It may not have much sense to you if you're not into this world. It's called neural structure activation of the neural points. And I'm working also with a reflex called spinal parades. But look here what happens. All of a sudden, I'm working on that part of the body. Look what's going on in this part of the body. We've got some head lifting. At that moment, the mother's like, oh, wait, wait. My little girl never, never turned her head from one side to the other. Because a two-week-old baby, we think they don't have head control, they cannot lift it up. Mind you, she has Down syndrome. Uh, Look, she went from right to left, left to right, she's clearing her airways. This is the beginning of a head white. I haven't touched the head, I haven't gone even there. I'm working on this link, cranial sacral. Sacral cranial. So, that was the real time, one minute, and I'm rechecking this automatic gate. There we go. Do you see something that was turned on? It's, it's obvious. Is it like the very first video? Not yet. Not yet. Look, it's, it's better. On the way back, it gets even better. Look at this. Look at this. A baby that one minute before had no response has trisomy 21 with mutation of the 21 gene. So there is some change possible there. And if this one reflex can change, and we do the work with every other reflex, you can kind of have a sense of what will happen. Now, I worked with this little girl for seven MNRI sessions, one hour each. She was then five weeks old. On top of being, uh, being diagnosed with Down syndrome, she was premature also. And they left the country, so this is the last session. I worked on every reflex, not just automatic gait, but I wanted to check the automatic gait again. And this is how she left. This is getting closer. It is not norm yet. But do you see the possibility there? It's like showing for one sample of this baby's whole profile of reflexes how working with the unit of the brain can make a difference. You know? And as a matter of fact, I kept in touch with the family and this baby started walking at 17 months. For a child with Down syndrome, it's pretty extraordinary. She only had the five, se the seven session because they left uh, to South America and had no MNRI uh, access. But anyway, so I will finish with this. What can we do for those babies? What is the Masgotova method proposing for those babies? We're saying that if we get our hands on those babies ASAP, as soon as possible early intervention, regardless we have an established condition, we can set a baby to very great success. This is the very first MNRI conferences that we had only with babies. We have those for all ages, a regular, we call regular family conferences, but this was the first one with the focus on infant and babies. And so those parents brought their little babies and we worked with them for four days, four hours a day, that's a 16 hours boost. And the results were pretty remarkable. 
with lots of change. Some babies were completely neurotypical, and others had known challenges, and they all made some positive changes. Very, very rewarding work. You see how we work with the babies, we have the team, and just for you to illustrate in images, just here we have Dr. Nelly, Dr. Nelly and her son, Dr. Elvin. Dr. Nelly is Dr. Masutawa's sister. Dr. Andrew, which is awesome, <laughs> sure. And uh, this was our center. Yes. Oops. All right. So this is it. I want to thank you for uh, your curiosity and coming here. I will just make one comment. I have three children on my own. They're grown up now, like 17, 20, and 23. And I have, if I have one regret in my life, is that I did not have this knowledge when they were little, when they were babies, when we talk about early intervention. And sure, like any other kids, we think they're the best, they're so advanced. They have issues. <laughs> And you wish. So I did not have the knowledge. We cannot feel guilty about something we don't know. When you talk to your parents, sometimes you say this and you see their face like they are like sinking in guilt. So you dear parents that are here, there is no place for guilt when you don't know. <laughs> I've seen one going like this. Absolutely. When you know, it's different because then we have the uh, knowledge to do. So I just made the promise to my children that when they have their own, I will make my grandchildren the best integrated possible, whether they have their challenges or not, will take them the way they are and make them as resilient as possible. So thank you. I really appreciate it, all of you being there. It's late. You know, bit tired, but I hope that you can take some pieces of this, share this, because you understand uh, how important uh, this is. And it's our responsibility, truly, as claim, if we claim we're professional in the neurodevelopment uh, field, it's our responsibility to make people aware of this, I mean, no doubt. So I will be very happy to answer some of your questions, if you have some. Amazing. So, it is. You can what tell I know this. <laughs> okay. I think it is. Uh, I mean, it is a bit and late. Baby Luna was there. Baby yeah. Luna was there. Yeah. So I will uh, let you go. I just have this two minutes little video for leaving this lecture with lots of things in your mind and maybe, I hope, inspiring some of you. I mean, we have Dr. Maskutova, we have Pamela, we have core specialists with us, and this is what really keeps us go and get up in the morning and say, I have a mission here, I can do, it. I can make a difference. I mean, truly, I hope you feel this uh, inspiration. I'm very inspired by Dr. Mezgutova, by uh, Pamela others, and uh, I want to spread this, like, the chain of inspiration. Okay, and it's allowed to move <laughs> with the rhythm. <laughs>